Thank you so much for that. Melissina. Oh, I spelled that name right. Yes. Melissina. So, um, as a matter of fact, we need to give out the raffle tickets to everybody. So, um, do me a favor. Grab the raffle tickets, right, and rip them in half. I did bring a scissor. It should be a scissor in that bag to cut them in half, or you could just rip them in half and, and you know, just disperse them. So, we're going to do that. Don't drink too much Fairmont Put the cup on the floor once you're done with this. So we're going to get these uh, raffle tickets out. Yes. If you remiss, I didn't mention uh, these are from a good man, Hippo Life. He has a, uh, a Cremont brand called Aquasun. As a matter of fact, this is what you're drinking at the top of the line. <laughs> yeah, it's forty five dollars a bottle. So trust me. I could have went a cheap route, but like, nah, let me get the top of the line for you know for my people. But he's actually he was supposed to be here this evening originally, but there's a contest in New York. Uh, Fairmont contest in New York, but he actually won, I think, last year, the year before. So he's at that conference, um, the competition today. But you know, he, he showed love, you know, with the bottles and everything. And uh, you have this information on my website or my social media. So everyone should get a bookmark, and, and everyone who RZT, uh, there's a there's a pin that I have on my shirt right here. Y'all can see it before we leave. But this one's a raffle drawing. Once he puts the the second. Um, second half of the ticket and inside the, the tin, and I can shake the tin and we get to the raffle drawing. You, you, got the other, you got the other half? Yes, everyone can you please rip your tickets in half so we can place them inside the bucket. So she's going to come around with the with the bucket. Rude, get, get her to the tin bucket. Many of the paintings um, that we have here today, uh, obviously, uh, it's of Haitian ancestry. Uh, many in the back here and some in the front. But I was talking about the canal, and I want to go into the farming in Haiti. Now, Haiti, for those who don't know, Haiti once produced 60% of the world's coffee and 40% of the world's sugar. Um, and this was at the height of slavery back in the late 18th century, early 19th century. Mm -hmm. And it was once the richest colony in the world. Um, but it came with a price. It came with, it came with a very hefty price where the life expectancy was probably two to three years. And then, you know, they'll work you to death and then we'll have another group, a group of Africans come in from the motherland and take your place. Now, I think I should tell you guys a little bit about me. 
and, and why I'm talking about the, the, the plantations and the slavery. When I was in high school, I was reading in a book. It was, it was a black, black history teacher, and in the book, you know, they teach you about Napoleon, they teach you about Japanese and uh, Hispanic history in Mexico, Spain, but never hear about anything about African history or anything in the Caribbean. But when I was reading, it, when I was reading in the class, and I wasn't big on history back then. There was one sentence that said, um, "Toussaint Louverture defeated Napoleon back in, you know, uh, what ended 18. We declared independence 1804, but the war ended like 1802, 1803. Mm. It started in 1790, not 1791, like most people believe. But when I read that in the book, I'm like, hold up, isn't Napoleon the greatest military?" and the greatest uh, leader of the greatest army in the world at the time. Like, why is it just this one sentence? And, you know, and, and I don't know, it's probably Haitian, but I didn't know the history. So that, that piqued my interest. And moving forward, when, when I got to college, I had a course called the Study of, of the Caribbean. And we had to learn about each individual Caribbean island, specifically mainly Haiti, but also Jamaica and Bahamas. But in this one book that I was reading, I learned a lot about Tucson and also how did they become the richest college in the world? You know, what, 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 what actually took place? And that took me in a rabbit hole. So by the time I got into my junior year, I had another course called African Studies. And I was thinking to myself, and I was before that university, I made in central science, minor marketing, um, played football, ran track, almost all my life. Hung around a lot of Americans. Even though my, my, my community was mainly, it was mainly Haitians and Americans, but I was always in sports, so I wasn't really hanging around a lot of Haitians if they wasn't playing football or running track, um, or you know, catch them on the weekend and we hang out. So, but by the time my, my junior in college uh, went around, it wasn't just like track and field, I probably would never be in college, but when, but when I took this course, we had a protest to get African studies taught. Before that university, they didn't have anything with African studies, but we had a protest and uh, somewhat boycott some of our classes until they actually gave us, you know, what we were asking for. And so when I took this Caribbean course, it really opened my eyes to see what was going on. And then the African studies course, the, prof the professor, Dr. Vetrovitz, I forget what country in Africa she was from. She asked everyone in the classroom to, to pick a country, and I asked, you know, to do Kenya. She knew I was taking. She said, why would, you, why would you choose Kenya? I said, you said we treat anybody we want. She's like, no, I want you to do the home, which is Benin today. And I was like, okay, it didn't make no difference. I didn't know anything too much about either of the country. So when I did this project, it really, at the time, I loved being Haitian, but now I was really proud of being Haitian because I, I was able to study and do research on what what created Haiti? What type of people created Haiti? And they were from the western, most of Haiti come from the western part of Africa called the home, the home people now it's called Benin. If you watch the movie uh, Woman King, or what else do they have about the, the home people? Well, you got Wakanda, you know, some people say Haiti represents what, what the real Wakanda is. But if you watch Woman King, that word kingdom was really based on where Haitians come from. Most Haitians come from this region, region of Africa, and also the Congo. Have you guys done the a little sidebar? Have you guys done the DNA ancestry test? No. Well, where, where, where did yours say most of your people came from? All oh, right. My answer that it came from most of my DNA came from the Congo, 30 percent from the Congo, 30 another 30 percent from Nigeria, and 15 percent the home. And I was surprised because it was at 15%. I'm like, yes, I'm from the homies, but you only get 15%. Now, the reason why I mention that 
agriculture and farming, so that, that was big for us. And also mountains as well. Most of these pictures have mountains in them, especially with this one right here. I purchased this one myself in Haiti in, uh, at the Cafe Saint, not Milo, a town called Milo. It's not too far from Cafe Saint, the north of Haiti. But when you're in this, when, you, when you're here, you literally, when you climb up, it's about a two hour hike. I think it's two hours walking and 45 minutes on a horse. You was just there, you didn't have long. But how long did it take you guys to get on the mule? About 45 minutes? Mm -hmm. Yeah, about 40. We did motorbike and horse. Oh, motorbike. See, they didn't give us that option. Yeah. So, um, but this is, is one of the only fortresses in the world like this anywhere. And when, when, when you get on the top, you're literally in the clouds. It was one of the most, like, eerie feelings I ever had in my life. Because this stands about 3,000. The Twin Towers, the North and, North and South Towers, both are about, I want to say, 13, uh, 13 1,400 um, feet high. This is 3,000 feet high on top of the mountain. Mm. And you know the Twin Towers are not short buildings. But this, so when I, when I was there, I was like, what were they thinking to build something like this? Like, like what, what was, like, in their comfort, what was in their spirit? But it's just, I mean, it's magnificent. When I, as a matter of fact, when I was in Haiti, and it rained a lot when I was there, but... The day before I left, I told my cousin, look, I don't care what happens, I'm not leaving Haiti without going there. I don't care if it's raining, I don't care if it's thundering, I must go see this and see this out. And so that's what we end up doing, going to see it. And there's a rock I have, uh, the roof, this is a uh, box, the temptation of black box. 
we got, you can see the stone. Can you open that box for me? And show them that stone. So I, 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 I couldn't take a cannon home with me. <laughs> so, I, so I took a, a very unique stone, and you guys can pass that stone around and when you turn it down, they put it back in the box. I had to take it with me. I, I may make it into a necklace. Possibly. Because it, it looks like a tip of an arrow or something yeah, like that. Yeah. Right. So th that's why I took it. I was like, man, what, what can I take? You know? Even though I bought some things from the Sibina shop, I wanted, I wanted to ask for something that was directed at some Haitians. But the Citadel, Chris Christoph, Kring, King Henry Christoph built the, the Citadel in 1820, mm -hmm. started a project in 1806, mm -hmm. took 15 years. And, and what I just found out is Jean Jardis only commissioned the building of this um, fortress. But he wasn't alive to see it to the end. Mm -hmm. Obviously, he was assassinated, I believe, in uh, 1806. Okay, mm -hmm. assassinated in 1806. And uh, King Henry Christoph, mm -hmm. when, when he built this, um, there's about, I want to say, 300 cannons. Mm -hmm. There's 300 cannons around this, this um, citadel. And there are, and, and they built it to hold about 5,000 people. Mm -hmm. You know, just in case the French would come back to put it. As a matter of fact, let me show you guys this. <laughs> now, this is a, a bowl of black beans. I'll show you a magic trick. So, if you see birds flying from that, don't, uh, don't run. Just stay right there, okay? <laughs> now, the beans represent. Black power, black unity, and the Africans that were in Haiti. So what with, with, with Toussaint did with King Henry Christoph, and sometimes the farmers, would, would, they were very worried or petrified by being re-enslaved. I mean, this was their nightmare. So that's why they fought, that's why they feared to gain their independence. And, I mean, they fought, the French were like, man, these people are crazy. They, they're just fighting to the death. And the French never facing any Tucson grabbed a bowl like this and said, this is us. Right? Black people. And he just picked a, a couple pieces of grains of rice. And it was like, this is them. Mm -hmm. They come here to this island. You think they're going to beat us? I don't know. You know, so he knew how to talk in layman terms to make people understand him. That's why he was such a, a great leader. A great statesman. Um, obviously, military strategist. And they don't give him the credit of being the greatest uh, hero or military soldier of all time. And that's the picture of I have a picture of him oh, wow. here. And this is a print, not a painting, this is a print copy of, of a painting. But I'm going to go into why um, it's hard to find a, a picture, an actual portrait of, of General Tucson. But next, I want to get my man Big Root here to come and perform before we continue. So we're going to perform and then, then we're going to have uh, Sue 9. As a matter of fact, let's do the rapper drawing. 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 You have to come up here because people don't think, people, people don't think you're cheating. So let's do it again. Let's do it. People don't think you're cheating. And this is Amber. She's a teacher as well. All right, ticket number seven eight three zero five one. Ticket number seven eight three zero five one.
Saints won the Redbacks. Yes, sir. Okay, okay. Yeah. 
So, now, where were we? General Toops talked over to us. I'm trying to, I want to show you guys. Now, I had to cover this. I didn't want nobody trying to knock this over or, you know, write it right on it. But I want to show you guys something. You know what this is? Nobody. <laughs> and you know what it's nobody represents. Tony Bonaparte represented white supremacy. He's a godfather of white supremacy. Mm. And I actually have a painting. It's like man, probably seven feet by nine. It's a huge painting of Napoleon on the, on the white horse. Yeah. So it's a long story I got that painting. But when I, had, when I got that painting, actually I got it right after COVID. We got a quarantine. I was at an auction. And I was, I was looking to purchase some ivory. Because I'm an ivory collector as well. And um, when I went there, the ivory that was there was fake, right? So I was like, all right, I'm that alone. But as I'm walking out, out, out the venue, I see this huge painting on the wall, and, and I knew who it was automatically. Now, so you may be asking me, why would you want a picture of a white man on the white horse? Is that what you guys ask me? Yeah. All right. Now, yeah, it's humongous. You literally have to have a match. And then, so um, I didn't bring it here today with me. But the reason why is because he was the arch enemy of my hero, General mm -hmm. Toussaint Louverture. So I, I, so I felt as if I captured the enemy, mm -hmm. so to speak. So, as a matter of fact, there's a museum in France that wants to purchase it from me, but uh, I'm going to hold on to it. And, and I still want to come and say you could have it in France. Yeah. Actually, I did have it in France. Okay. I did. And, and um, that, that's between me and you. Yeah. <laughs> 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 so, um, look, you know, so I, I collect art. I went to a, another antique place and then I saw this. I'm like, all right, perfect. I don't have to bring this big painting into the Griot Museum. So, Napoleon was the leader, what they call Emperor Napoleon, the leader of the French army. And uh, that's, they have a pretty big movie coming out about him in November. I don't know if you guys know about it. It's a huge movie. It's like a $200 million budget for this movie, believe it or not. Now, Mr. Danny Glover been working on a movie on Tucson yeah. since 1999, yeah. right? And they recently, I think around 20, 2015, 2016, made it public they're not going to continue with the movie on Tucson. And so he was raising $30 million to, to make this movie. Uh, Hugo Chavez, former president of Venezuela, he pitched in, I don't remember the exact number, but a few million dollars, I, I want to say $10 million towards the movie. Oprah Winfrey, she, she, she invested in it. And the, the actors who were going to be in the movie was Wesley Snipes. Has anybody ever heard about this movie? Yeah. Okay, Wesley Snipes was going to be two songs. Uh -huh. uh, you had um, Angela Bassett. You had Don Chidel, uh, Mr. Pierre, and a couple other people were going to play. It's going to be a big box office hit. But the reason why the movie didn't, didn't continue is because Danny Glover refused to put a white hero in the movie. And so, so, they, so they blackballed it and he didn't continue with it. Wow. Right, he's a white savior. Just like in Black Panther. They had the oh, white CIA agent, yeah. Yeah. You, know, you know, help save you know, the, black, the African nation. Same concept they wanted with the Tucson story, but Danny Glover wasn't going for it. But the Napoleon movie, they raised $200 million. They've only raised, they only, uh, the, in the box office so far in Europe, they made about $30 million. So they wait to see how much they're going to make here in the United States. I'm going to go see it because I love history. And um, Mr. Napoleon is one of, the, one of the few figures that I can give you a presentation on without even doing any type of reading. Because I've been inundated with so much information about Napoleon, about George Washington, Abraham Lincoln, but nothing about General Toussaint, nothing about King Henry Christoph, mm. nothing about Jean Jacques Dessalines, mm. nothing about Suzanne Belair and the other Haitian. Um, warriors that fought. Or mm. even go to Africa, Queen Azinga, mm -hmm. um, Sh uh, Shaka Zulu, you have Queen Tai, King Tut, mm -hmm. Manson Musa. There's so many names that we haven't been haven't been taught. But I, I had to bring them today because uh, on my YouTube, as a matter of fact, once you guys get a bookmark, I'm sure you guys, if you don't have a bookmark yet, you can get one eventually. I know Mr. Ruben Amber is going to help out with that. There's a box of them if you guys don't, don't have them. I did a presentation on my YouTube uh, years ago 
with, with the, the big painting of Napoleon that I have, and also this one of Tucson. And I just compare and contrast. Who was a better warrior, better mm. leader? But to this day, they still praise Napoleon as the best, mm. um, as greatest. But if, 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 I'm, if I'm Mike Tyson, right, and you might be Floyd Mayweather, and, and, and Floyd, Mayweather, Floyd Mayweather was considered the best, and the Tyson beat him, I know they're two different classes. He's a boxer as well. Mm. One of the two, about 100 pounds different, right? But um, but if you're the best and I beat you, that makes me the best mm -hmm. or, or the greatest. But they don't, the history doesn't show that about Tucson. Now, for a very long time, I've been trying to explain. Can you move that camera toward this way? A little bit? No, this way. Yeah. I've been trying very hard to, to explain um, the importance of General Tucson. There's a significance of him. Because I didn't quite understand up until maybe, even when I was in college studying, uh, I think maybe about 25 years old when I started reading and, and, and as a matter of fact, I didn't think he was a real person. I thought Tucson was a major league individual. Right? They made him up. Mm. My cousin in Miami, Mr. Gary, Gary Pierre, shout out to Gary, uh, he's also my business partner. When I told him that, he was like, Kevin, I love you, but don't tell him. Don't, yeah. don't, don't ever say that in public. <laughs> Thank you. 
two million Haitian children starving on the streets of Haiti. Wow. Two million. Me being a father, and uh, I have to We're going to have to do prayer for us. You still do prayer with me, no? Um, me being a father, I've always been involved with children and mentoring. Even now, with the Black Boys Anonymous, every third Saturday of the month in Atlanta, we mentor the young black boys. It's probably on Instagram. You see me post a flyer every now and then um, regarding that program. But when it comes to children, you know, it's a soft spot in my heart. Even now, soft since I'm a father. I have two beautiful baby girls. And to think that these children don't get the same kind of love from their parents. Or even the government. You know, that really motivates me to do something. And that's why we started Black Legacy Tour, Stop the War Against Haiti. And we started this tour in Chicago. And, and you might ask me, well, why Chicago, not Atlanta? Well, Chicago was founded by a Haitian man, Jean Pastor. And the fact that he discovered Chicago, and I figured I wanted people to take this seriously and what we're doing for Haiti seriously, so let's, let's go to Chicago. So we hosted the event there at the Haitian American Museum of Chicago. And so shout out to them if, if they're watching this, once we make this video live. Um, they show me a lot of love in Chicago, beautiful city as well. But the fact that it's been about a year and a half since we, we started this um, GoFundMe, GoFundMe is titled Stop the War Against Haiti. And I realized thanks to Dr. Emmett Wilson, who was a black child psychologist up, up in New York. He died back in the 90s, but his books are profound. He literally saved my life. My nonprofit called The Courage to Believe International, it was founded because of him. He had a book called Black on Black Violence Black Self Annihilation in Search of White Domination. That's the whole title of his book. And when I read that book, it changed my life and, and made me want to do something. In started the annual Black on Black Crime Solutions Panel. We did it for six years straight. The last time we did it was in Atlanta, um, the year before COVID. Actually, the year COVID, we did it indoor as well. We did it online instead of doing it in a public setting. We haven't done it since. However, the reason why I'm bringing that up, because Dr. Amos Wilson, he focuses on finding the problem, not the symptom, but the problem. And one of the problems that we have, not even one of the problems, but a lot of the symptoms that we have in Haiti is the homelessness, starvation, the violence. What else, what else am I missing? Corruption. Corruption. Sexual abuse. Sexual abuse, sexual violence, which is rampant and disgusting. These are all symptoms. The problem is the economics. When you have young black men trying to make it any kind of way, sometimes you're going to lean towards negative ways to go about it. And that's what we're seeing right now. Now, how did Haiti go from black excellence to the state of depravity we have right now? I'll tell you. <laughs> now, and I, and I promised myself I was going to make this a, a black history program because I can go on forever, trust me. So I'm writing a book now called The Americans and France is a Thousand Year War Against Haiti, the Assassination of a Nation. It comes out next year in May. Uh, and I'm having pre-orders at my table there if anybody wants to pre-order that book and you don't have done it already, so thank you. When when Haiti gained its independence, it was declared in 1804, January 1st, under Jean-Jacques Dessalines. In 1825, about 20 years later, one years later, there was um, the, the president Boyer, I don't remember his first name, but Boyer was the president, and he was making deals, he was trying to, say again, yeah. Pierre Boyer, he was trying to make deals with France and offer them a settlement, I didn't know about this, he was trying to offer them a settlement to pay them for the property that they lost. Hmm? But France kept turning turning it down. It's like, no, we don't want that. We're not even entertaining that. But eventually, one of the French kings, I believe, I believe was, um, I don't remember his name. Don't care. He's just, 1825, so that's what you're going to do. Y'all going to pay us 150 million gold francs for our lost property with plantations and the property as in people, the African people that either died or, or rebelled. So, so under... President Boyer, 
Boyer, Boyer, Haiti agreed to pay that ransom. Now, Boyer believes that, you know, Haiti's going to fight another fight like that again, like they did during the Haitian Revolution. Like, you know, we lost a lot of men, thousands, hundreds of thousands of men. We can't take on the French again. Let's go ahead and sign this deal. But what he did not know is that he literally sold the soul of Haiti when he did that. Because all that money, it took 122 years to pay France that the 150 million gold francs, which was reduced to 90 million gold francs. But when you do the math today, that money is equivalent to it, including inflation, $28 billion. So when you look at Haiti, a lot of people look at Haiti like, you know, it's a poor country and they're backwards. Look at the, you know, look at the history. What caused it to be that way? On, on top of that, Haiti had to pay an increase, I think, 40% interest rate on the loan, and they had to borrow money from French banks who was already taxing them on top of the tax they were taxing. So it was economic slavery, a new form of type of slavery, ran to the T. Now, fast forward, 1915, Haiti was occupied by the U.S. from 1950 to 1934. At that time, the U.S. had moved the border of, okay, you have DR and Haiti, DR on the east side, Haiti, Haiti on the west. They moved the, the border between the two more to the, more to the west so that DR would be bigger than Haiti. themselves in the DR but by the change of the border. On the, not only that, the U.S. changed the Constitution that Tucson wrote and Jean John Dishonne wrote that no foreigners can own land. Now, the U.S. came, one of the first things they did, other than rob the, 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 the National Church of Bank of Haiti, which was owned by France, it had a Haitian name on it, but France later owned the bank. But the U.S. Marine came in and robbed $500,000 worth of gold and took, that, took the gold to New York City Bank. That type of money was used for infrastructure, roads, schools, hospitals, you know what I'm saying, et cetera, et cetera. So that's a, another hard blow to Haiti. And, the, and on, on top of that, the U.S. did a, they wrote a, 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 uh, a treaty, the Haitian American Treaty of 1916, which you won't find because they changed the name to the Haitian American Convention of 1916. So that's why I can really find information because they changed the name so that if we were able to try to fight this, this treaty, we'd be able to fight it. Now, what's in this treaty? One, it's in black and white, and I read it myself, and I'm going to have it in my book, about the War Against Haiti, that the U.S. owns and controls Haiti's economic um, infrastructure. It owns the banks, the finance, they own and control that. And also control the military. So those are two huge things that a sovereign country must have control over, and Haiti does not have that, which means Haiti is no longer a sovereign country. There, Haiti is owned and, and was re-enslaved by the United States of America during the occupation, literally, physically, and financially. So back to what I was saying about Dr. Dr. Amos Wilson regarding symptoms and problems. We're focused so much on the symptoms of, of things we see on the news, but the problem is that the U.S. controls Haiti. It does not have control of its own destiny. And Frederick Douglass said this back in 1893, that we have not yet forgiven Haiti for she is black. And he was from, he, he actually used to live in Haiti three years. He was the ambassador to Haiti for about three years. That's great. And he was actually getting ready to move to Haiti. But the Civil War took off, so he had to stay in America. But he wanted to, he was trying to promote as many African Americans to come, come to Haiti. Because if you reach to Haiti, if you could escape the plantation, you were free in Haiti. You know, they call Haiti the freedom land. So, the reason why we're having the Black Legacy Tour, Stop the War Against Haiti, the reason why we're having this event, the reason why we have the GoFundMe raising the money so that we can lobby, not just in front of the White House, but actually go to Capitol Hill strategically and have the congressmen and women uh, eradicate that tree. That treaty is also the 1996 Farm Bill. The 1996 Farm Bill is a bill that Bill Clinton passed in order for uh, Deeper Charles Eric, the former president of Haiti, to be able to, to come back and be president. He 
Yeah. So good saying this will happen. Because if Biden's calling him, don't do it. You're going to cripple the economy. The, you know, the country's going to, you know, they're going to crumble. The, the farming industry, our coal industry is going to, you know, uh, well, I can't say that word, but collapse. <laughs> collapse. Better word. <laughs> Lack of better word. It's going to collapse. He did it anyway. As a matter of fact, in 2010, after the earthquake, he felt the need to apologize for canceling that deal. Um, the next time he just farm deal. Not only that, So this is money that's supposed to be used for for anything and everything dealing with hate. You know, even dealing with the, the trash that you see on the floors of hate. There's no sanitary company picking it up to use it. The country can't pay for it. Bill Clinton literally, and, 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 and to be honest with you guys, I don't know how many of you guys are um, Barack Obama supporters here. I want to I, I wanna say something before I say it, because I don't want to make no enemy, but I just want to take out the truth. There's two things. One, Barack Obama, he never visited Haiti. That's the one thing. Haiti's first independent black republic in the world, and you don't come to the country. His wife did. So the Obama came, but Barack Obama never did. But the main thing I want you guys to focus on is that everyone's aware of the corruption behind Bill Clinton and George Bush. When there's oil, George Bush is going to be there. Afghanistan, Iraq, Haiti. Clinton is known to have siphoned, stolen millions and millions of dollars from Haiti. Now, when the earthquake happened in 2010, which wasn't an actual earthquake, by the way, that was that was a man-made earthquake that looked for oil and gold in Haiti. And for example, when Hiroshima happened, World War One or World War Two? World War Two. 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 They bombed Hiroshima. They killed roughly about a million people. I mean, the numbers are crazy. Y'all know how many thousand between the United Nations? Like a thousand? Two hundred thousand between the United Nations and Jerusalem. And plus the injuries. I remember reading something about two two million people affected by it. Oh, yeah. Maybe even more. Yeah, more. That's not more. more. Yeah, the radiation, yeah, the radiation and, and yeah. all of that. Now, now then when the murder is willing to put a bomb on top of the earth, who makes you think they're going to put a bomb under the earth, right? So that earthquake killed 350,000. The U.S. Embassy, which is in Port au Prince, wasn't affected at all. Um, the DR barely affected. But Port au Prince and the neighboring uh, southern cities were devastated. Barack Obama, he puts Bill Clinton and George Bush in charge of the Haitian relief effort. So I'm asking myself, I'm looking at this now, why would he choose Bill Clinton? Now, at the time, I was a supporter of Barack Obama. I didn't know any better. But... But the imagery of Barack Obama is powerful because you have a black man in the White House that motivates us. A lot of people in the Tupac sense, you know, there'll never be a, you know, American ready for black president, you know. So, but I'm looking at this, and as I'm researching and reading, Barack Obama put these two in power. Now, why would he do that knowing the history of Bill Clinton has with a and knowing the greed of George Bush? Because he's in bed with all of them. They all be these mega, multi-million dollar people. They make all these deals together behind the scenes, and that's why he chose them. Because what, 13, was it 13 million? How much money was it when they the reason that was? I don't want to say million, but was it, was it 13 billion? Yeah. It was a crazy amount of number, but only about three houses were made. Three, four, three, three to five houses were made. Six. Six houses were made, and and Bill Clinton, George Bush, and all his friends just just enjoy the money, and the Haitian government, people get blamed for corruption and spending the money, when actually it, just, it never got to the hands of the Haitian government. So, well, moving forward, 
we're raising we're raising the money and we're continuing fighting, continue speaking, as I mentioned, with the Washington DC, with Ms. Chantal, and Utah Business Group. Um, I spoke in New York, Chicago, here in Atlanta, Georgia, and we're gonna continue doing this because even though a lot of Haitians put a lot of effort into now right now, which I'm thank God they're doing that, a lot of fundraisers for hospitals, et cetera, et cetera, these things are dealing with the symptoms, but the problem so it's not that far. I don't think most people don't know about the Haitian American Treaty of 1915. They don't know about the 20,000 Haitian plus Haitians that were assassinated or the fact that assassinated were killed or the fact that the U.S. Marines received medical, medical honors for the savagery they did in Haiti. A lot of people don't know about that. But I'm, doing, I'm making it my business to do so. Because I know General Kusal Lovinger wouldn't want any of us that's sitting down watching his ancestors get, get kicked down the way they are doing right now. And so I, I definitely give a shout out to everybody who, who supported us, who've been donating since the beginning, um, all the ancestors that fought and paved the way for us to be here today. And as a matter of fact, speaking of that, all the art you see here is for sale, except for this one. Um, because that one, I wouldn't do too much to bring it to Haiti to here. But everything here is for sale from the, the president map. Um, from the, the, the farming pictures you have there. But, oh, that was a birthday gift. I can't do that one either. But everything else, the green one. Sad? Um, unfortunately, yes. Unfortunately, yes. But because I can always get another one of these, but these I can't. So we're gonna have a sign auction, and so I so I need to explain how the auction is gonna take place. Now, the bookmarks you have, you have my uh, my Zelle, Cash App, and website. So, if you're interested in one of these paintings, what you're going to do is, you're going to first bid one dollar, and in that dollar, you're going to give a description to which painting or even sculpture that you're interested in. I need to put this up. This is some of that need as well. Let me have it in my hand. <laughs> so, um, you're going to pay the one dollar, and you put a description and the details of which one that you're interested in, and I can tell you the price of it. And then, if there's more than one person that's interested, And, um, and that's how we make, make sure I say something about Mr. Chantal and her husband. Uh, I, I went to Mr. Chantal's house after he came from Washington, D.C. As a matter of fact, I don't even think you know how much I spent flying to D.C. to make sure I was there the same day, but it's all good as far as people. Um, but when we came back to D.C., we drove. And when I walked in the house, I seen that painting in her wall. And I was like, oh my God, I gotta have that painting at my event. It's one of the most beautiful paintings I've ever seen. And so it is also um, part of, of the auction and the proceeds we made a deal. We made a deal. So the, the nonprofit, as a matter of fact, our nonprofit is a 501c3, Courage to Believe International. So your donation or your purchase will be tax exempt. And so you'll get a tax exempt receipt. I just want to make sure I mention that. Um, and, and I want to do one more performance until we go on to the next phase and the food is getting ready. So um, want us to eat and get back to the business. So maybe, how many of you guys hungry? Let me ask that question. <laughs> if anybody's starving, put two hands up. And starving. <laughs> if you think you're going to pass out, put two hands up. Put two hands up. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I got that. All right, I got that. Hey, forgive me, but who will be here? Chef Lambert is a great chef. Um, and so what we're going to do is we're going to have a performance. We'll give you guys a moment to after the performance, walk around, or you can walk around now, then you can do the performance. In fact, you ready for more camera? Okay. <laughs> Keep it coming now. <laughs> um, but yeah, so let's do the performance. So now you ready? And then, so once, once you do his thing, then we're going we're gonna to take our recess break. The food will be here by then, and then we'll start eating and continue with the signing art.
And let's do another rapper drama. Bonsoir, quoi ça Bonsoir, bonsoir. Comment nous y est Bonsoir, bonsoir. Grâce à Dieu, béni soit l'éternel. <rire> bon Dieu qui bénit moi, qui quitte moi, béni devant nous là, pour nous chanter par nous. On peut l'histoire pour nous passer de façon pour nous venir devant aujourd'hui à la. Besoin de dire merci pour moi, moi, avec famille, moi, avec les amis, moi, qui continue à supporter moi avec le euh, bagage musique là, ce bagage qui fascine, qu'on est des bois ici. <laughs> Mais, eh, music has always been something that's interesting to me. Um, it connects, it's a part of culture, uh, brings us together. And, um, I got some reason for going on. But I wanted to say that uh, this is a very important movement, and um, I'm glad all of you are here today to support everything that's going on. My man's right here. You will spend a lot of time now when you share your prophecy. <laughs> Colonialism has been a thorn in the side of indigenous people around the globe. I have a shirt on this that says, Earth Life, we are children of the Earth. And um, I think it's also important for us to remember the situation that brought us in this particular position in the first place. We were fighting amongst each other. How did the Europeans learn how to treat us poorly? Only from observing the way that we treated each other. And I'm not trying to make an excuse. They definitely took what they learned and observed from us and took it to an extreme that we've never seen before. And I pray that the flower that comes out of this manure is that we can see the value in each other and the importance of each other and treat each other with kindness, respect, and compassion. Um, I make this music. I can't even tell you why. Um, they keep asking me to perform, so I gotta keep on doing it. But, uh, 
it's a blessing. And uh, I want to give a shout out to King Doraville. And uh, I say, <laughs> King Kevin Doraville. Um, I was able to meet up with him at Juneteenth, and that was a magnificent um, speech that he delivered over there. He's an author. Honestly, I'm proud of him. Like, the more I read about him and the more I, I, I understand him, the, the, the more passionate I become. I, like many people, was um, didn't understand uh, history and the importance of it. And as I learned history, it empowered me and it made me feel proud to wear this flag. When I was young, I used to catch a lot of heat for this flag. I feel like, in a way, I made it a trend. I didn't really care how people felt about it. I'm going to wear my flag. And it's not about the piece of dirt you're particularly born on, but it's also important to know your heritage and your culture. And we're in the Afrocentric Museum. So if you don't know your history, just understand that you were a child of the earth. And all of our history is our history. Because before Haiti got its name, you may remember. Does anybody remember the name of the whole entire island before it was called Haiti? Hispaniola. Hispaniola. And before we got there, we were in Africa. When we got there, there were indigenous people. There are indigenous people here in America. And just like when Napoleon went over to Tucson's house and destroyed potentially one of the only paintings that we have of him, how many other times in history have these colonizers did the same thing. It's important to, because I do agriculture myself, and I've been in the field chopping down trees with my machete, keep it on my side. So one day I chopped down a tree, and uh, recently we went back to that area to observe the things that we saw um, as we continuously for, uh, you know, making endeavors in agriculture. And what I noticed about the tree that we chopped down is that it actually started growing again. It just goes to the show when you connect it to your root, it doesn't even matter if they chop you down. You can still pour forth fruit. You can still bear fruit. So I got a couple songs for y'all. Hopefully y'all like it. First one got some Haitian lyrics on it, so we're gonna get Lenny. And uh, I got this machete on me. I keep it on me typically, but this is the perfect time for me to bring it out as well. And this one is my favorite one. This is my favorite machete I've ever owned in my whole entire life. Particularly because it's got the wood grain handle, which you can't really find a lot of places. And if you do find a wood grain handle, most of the time the machete isn't a good quality. It'll break on you. This is actually starting to break. I've been hitting it too hard. I have to get a new one soon. But the machete was not a tool of war. The machete is for agricultural purposes. But the same tool that we used to cultivate the land is the same tool that we used to destroy the colonizers. So. Yeah, man. 